Hello, good morning everybody and welcome to St Francis Church. My name's Sarah and I'm the lead minister here and it's really lovely uh, to have so many of you both on Zoom and in the church building. You are so welcome wherever you are today. Uh, it's great to see that things are definitely in some senses getting back to normal. The front seats were absolutely empty, <laughs> yes, uh, but uh, I feel sure that... I, it, this, I'll have to think of clever ways to make these fill up first. Um, but anyway, I won't exert pressure too much. Um, hey, I don't know if you've been enjoying this gorgeous weather as much as I have. Um, hasn't it been beautiful? Oh, what's happening? They're waving frantically at me. Uh, I Oh, no, it's not turned on. Sorry, Zoomers. Okay, there we go. Hello Zoom, you can probably hear me better now. Can you give me a wave if you can hear me better? Yeah, that's great. Yeah, yeah, hello. It's lovely to see you all. <laughs> um, you might wonder, there's, there's just me around today. Cliff, my husband, who's often with us, um, is a prison chaplain and it's Law Sunday today. Now we're not going to be thinking a great deal about that in our service, but Cliff is up at, um, first of all, he's been working at the prison this morning, but he's also going up to Winchester Cathedral where there's a special service thinking about Law Sunday and just an opportunity to pray for all those in the judiciary, uh, for the police, for all those who work in that service of law and uh, of course Cliff representing the prison officers, the chaplaincy and thinking about the prisoners as well. So maybe we could be remembering uh, that sector in our prayers both as we go through the service and also uh, through the week. It's good to see Joe up on the screen. Uh, he and his family have been going through a bit of COVID. They're all all right, um, but we are keeping them at arm's length. Joe, it's lovely to see you on the screen. Um, we'll keep you in arm's length for a bit longer if you don't mind. Thanks very much. <laughs> He'll be back. They're all fine. But um, we just want to make sure that here in church, we're just being really uh, aware of trying to keep each other safe. Hence masks as we sing and all the rest. So thank you for that. But as we start our service together, there's a call to worship, and it would be great if you would join in the words in bold. So let's find those words up on the screen so that we can join in. This morning, we've come from scattered lives to meet with God. And so in this moment, let's recognize his presence with us. As God's people we have gathered, let us worship him together. And as we come together, let's take a moment to recognize those things that separate us from God. The Bible calls it sin, a word that we don't necessarily use very often, but it simply means things that we do in our own way that aren't of God. So let's make our confession. We'll just take a moment quiet and then do join with me in the words on the screen that are in bold. Let's pray together. Let's say together, O King enthroned on high, filling the earth with your glory. Holy is your name, Lord God Almighty. In our sinfulness, we cry to you to take our guilt away and to cleanse our lips to speak your word. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. So I can pray for us. May the God of love and power forgive you and free you from your sins. Heal and strengthen you by his spirit and raise you to new life in Christ our Lord. Amen. And let's say together the special prayer for uh, the 19th Sunday after Trinity, the collect for Trinity 19. Faithful Lord, whose steadfast love never ceases and whose mercies never come to an end. Grant us the grace to trust you and to receive the gifts of your love new every morning. 
in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. And as forgiven people, we can join together in worshipping God uh, in the words of the hymn, Guide Me, O Thou Great Redeemer. You know that in our series of talks, we are uh, following the journey of the Israelites out of slavery in Egypt and towards the promised land. And this hymn is very much written with those images in mind, and we might like to bear them in mind as we sing together. So let's stand wherever we are and join in with this hymn. about worship in our service this morning. Um, we actually don't have um, a, a feedback slot this morning. There'll be one, I'm sure, in the next week or two. But instead, um, we've got a live interview with Stephanie Shawley. Stephanie heads up our sung worship in the church, and it's going to be great to have her sharing a little bit about how worship is for her at the moment. And thinking really of how uh, we've been worshipping on Zoom together in lockdown and how we've now uh, been able to come together and sing together. Uh, but before I speak with Stephanie, I'm going to uh, ask uh, Chris to play a video clip. And this was written by somebody who was a worship leader and how they really struggled with not being able to sing together with people as we've been used to during lockdown. And it's one that Stephanie uh, brought to my attention, one that she asked if we might play this morning. And so why don't we have a listen to this poem this morning? There's this rising inside me, this voice, this desire. I want to raise my voice higher and join in the song and sing with my friends, my family, my church. And when I can't, it genuinely hurts. Something so naturally communal, singing brings joy, helps grieve at a funeral, masks in church and choirs on furlough, suddenly stuck in a season of singing solo. Fractured and broken, we sing alone in our homes. 
There is a brief joy I see, albeit digitally, of joining our fellow singers, both he and she, online. Virtual choirs are good, but they are not the same. So I sing alone, on my own. It's hard, all my failures exposed. Sometimes mulling, what's the point? I'm no good, it's not fair. Lord God, can you even hear? Sometimes forgetting my maker is near. He whispers, I am with you, I'm for you, I adore you. If that's not worth singing for, what is? True? Eyes off the circumstance and on he who has spoken, he knows what I have to offer is broken. Right now, I am not permitted to hear, but I am not singing alone as I sometimes fear. The ears of the Almighty are always listening to me, to us, and to creation's offering. A collaboration of voices rises from homes, from each and every one who's alone, joined together in cacophony of praise. What a beautiful sound it must make. They join with mountains and stars and trees, the birds, the buzz, the sound of the breeze, the rocks cry out, everything that has breath all joining together in a melodic mess. If creation is singing, I'll join in the sound, even if all my notes fall to the ground. For up from the ground, God does beautiful things. From the dust exhales life, what wonder he brings, what life grows when we sing. So, I'll sing alone, on my own, push through the uncomfortable zone. I'll sing as I walk my kids to the park. I'll sing in a whisper when it feels dark. I'll sing as I play a few wobbly chords on guitar. I'll sing out loud as I drive in the car. I'll sing in the shower. I'll sing in the streets. I'll sing even if the ends don't meet. For even if this situation never changes, I'll sing to God, the rock of ages, and add my contribution to creation's cry. Refuse to be embarrassed and shy. I long for the day when we all join to sing. That stunning picture that Revelation brings as we bow down together to worship the King. A multitude, a mass of voices will ring. Stephanie, thank you for bringing that to our attention. And I think as we are actually beginning to uh, just get used again to singing together, maybe those lockdown moments are slightly beginning to slip from our memories. And yet I'm sure that every one of us here can relate to how it felt. And I wonder what uh, you wanted to say about that. Tell us how it was for you. Uh, yeah, it was painful at times. And um, when I found that, video clip, it just made me cry because that's how I felt. And that's kind of why I wanted to, uh, for you guys to see. I know it almost feels out of date, but equally it's not because still some of us are at home, still we feel a little uncomfortable with singing and we're kind of learning new ways, aren't we? But yes, yeah, certainly when we were at home, those very early days when Peter said, we can do church on Zoom and we were like, how? And then I was sat in my house, you all saw, a lot of you saw me, and I was like, is it going to work? Are they going to be able to hear me? Am I going to play the right notes? Am I going to sing the right words? Can anybody hear? Is anybody out there? And that's honestly how it felt. It was horrible, I can't tell you. <laughs> We've certainly been on a bit of a journey, haven't we, as a church, and we're not yeah. back to normal, as you rightly say. And I know I'm 
as leading, not wearing a mask, but it's not that great singing with a mask on, is it? People in here, you're all like, yeah, it's pretty rubbish. <laughs> Um, and yet we know that that is, singing is one of the things that's probably uh, slightly more risky. So that's why we're saying, oh, better sing with masks on. Mm. Um, Stephanie, how did it feel um, doing it all on Zoom? I mean, you've mentioned we talked yeah. a little together about we felt like we're performing yes. more than worshipping. And I wonder Absolutely. if you wanted to speak to yeah, that Yeah, definitely. I mean... I think the pressure of getting it right, especially when Outreach Radio were listening, was listening in, I mean, Sarah and I talked about it a lot, was, was really hard. Um, and it did feel more like performance. We practiced and practiced, did everything we could possibly do to get it right. And that feeling of getting it right almost detracted from the fact it was worship, really, because suddenly you were focused so much on those dots on the page. Um, whereas actually we want to get back to focusing on God and lifting him up. So could you say something about the difference for you between performance and worship? Yeah, okay, so for me, I've got to get beyond the notes, right? The notes have got to be incidental really to the, to the whole thing. So I've got to get beyond that and actually be focused on God and lifting him high. And I often get that, 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 that thing in my head about worshipping God, about bowing down before him. But then actually God comes, Jesus comes and says, lift up your head, lift up your head to the coming king. You know, raise your eyes, look up to me. And um, that's what I love about worship. And actually, if you focus too much on the dots, you can't really do that. So could you sort of summarise what's so important about worship for you? I mean, God tells us to worship him and bring praises. So in a sense, we're doing as he asks. Um, but I, I, I know some of us find sung worship more vital to our relationship with God than others. Some of us would rather find silence. Some of us uh, would rather find God in uh, words of the Bible. All of that's just fine. Um, but I su suspect the two of us may have a little particular uh, importance in sung worship. Yeah, I, I don't know. I, I think probably as a musician in particular, just singing to God. I mean, I, I sit in my house and I do sing alone. I do sit and play on my own. And, and I find that amazing. But singing with you guys, oh my <laughs> goodness. It's just so, so different. That feeling of us all lifting our voices up to God together it has just such a different feel. And we, we I think we, both of us, didn't we, appreciated it so much more because it had been taken away from us for so long. Yes, I don't know if any of you were here when we um, did the midnight service on Christmas Eve last year. And at the end of the service, we all went outside in order that we could actually sing a, a Christmas carol. And it was one of the most poignant moments of Christmas for me that we actually sang together. And I, as I say, I appreciate that for others, the poignancy would have been in sharing communion. Um, and yes, it was there for me, but um, I find God's presence in sung worship in a different way. Um, and, uh, you know, so singing all together is particularly uh, important for me. Absolutely. Um, yeah. Is there any, going forward, um, how are you finding, are you excited about how we might move Absolutely. forward together? Absolutely. And um... Well, it's fun. we've gained singers during lockdown. Isn't that amazing? Yeah, you know, wonderful. God has sent us singers or they've come out of the woodwork in some cases. And that's fantastic that we're going to have you know, new people who are going to be or are already helping us to worship God in, in sun worship. So that's fantastic. So, yeah, moving forward, it's going to be great. We're going to be all together again. Well, we are. But, you know, even more of us coming back gradually. I think if anybody out there is thinking, oh, I, I am a bit of a musician, I'd love to contribute, then do, Absolutely. do Please have do. a chat with Stephanie. <laughs> I know somebody already on the front row. Oh, she's <laughs> looking from side to side. Um, but genuinely, we are still uh, working out this combination of yeah. uh, being on Zoom and being in person in the building. And that's something we, it's a journey we all need to make together. And actually how you find it, uh, if you're worshipping in the congregation is, is really important for us to hear. So don't hesitate yeah. to let us know. And of course we can't 
uh, necessarily make it how we would really want it to be. Um, but uh, we're going to just add in once a month uh, a time of prayer and sun worship uh, in the evening. And it'll be really informal. It'll be quite simple, just um, acoustic guitar and singing. Uh, you're very welcome if you play an instrument to come and sing, but it, it, it won't be uh, very structured. We won't have a sermon, but we will be really seeking to spend some time in God's presence to sense his voice in our midst and just to enjoy uh, that sense of his presence in sun worship. So that's a little bit of an advert for six o'clock this evening <laughs> when we'll be meeting here, but we do want to do that at least, uh, you know, for the rest of this term, it'll just be once a month. But again, come along, see how you find that. Um, and uh, if uh, you've got feedback, do bring it to us uh, because we just want our worship to bring God glory and for it to be a place where we can find his presence in greater measure uh, to allow his spirit to work in our midst. Absolutely. Brilliant. Thanks. <laughs> Thank you. Stephanie. That's fantastic. Um, see you later. But we're going to find God in his spoken word now as Sue reads his word for us from Exodus. Thanks a lot, Sue. Thank you. Good morning. Um, the reading this morning is from Exodus 40, verses 16 to 38. Moses did everything just as the law commanded him. So the tabernacle was set up on the first day of the first month in the second year. When Moses set up the tabernacle, he put the bases in place, erected the frames, inserted the crossbars and set up the posts. Then he spread the tent over the tabernacle and put the covering over the tent as the law commanded him. He took the tablets of the covenant law and placed them in the ark, attached the poles to the ark and put the atonement cover over it. Then he brought the ark into the tabernacle and hung the shielding curtain and shielded the ark of the covenant law as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the table in the tent of meeting on the north side of the tabernacle outside the curtain and set the bread on it before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. He placed a lampstand in the tent of meeting opposite the table on the south side of the tabernacle and set up the lamp lamps before the Lord as the Lord commanded him. Moses placed the gold altar in the tent of meeting in front of the curtain and burned fragrant incense on it as the Lord commanded him. Then he put up the curtain at the entrance to the tabernacle. He set the altar of burnt offering near the entrance to the tabernacle, the tent of meeting, and offered on it burnt offerings and grain offerings as the Lord reminded, uh, commanded him. He placed a basin between the tent of meeting and the altar and put water in it for washing. And Moses and Aaron and his sons used it to wash their hands and feet. They washed whenever they entered the tent of meeting or approached the altar, as the Lord commanded Moses. Then Moses set up the courtyard around the tabernacle and altar and put up the curtain at the entrance to the courtyard. And so Moses finished the work. Then the cloud covered the tent of meeting and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. Moses could not enter the meeting, the tent of meeting, because the cloud had settled on it and the glory of the Lord filled the tabernacle. In all the travels of the Israelites, whenever the cloud lifted from above the tabernacle, they were set out. But if the cloud did not lift, they did not set out until the day it lifted. So the cloud of the Lord was over the tabernacle by day and fire was in the cloud by night in the sight of all the Israelites during all their travels. That's the end of the reading. Thank you so much, Sue. And I hope you recognize the fiery, cloudy pillar that we sang about in our first hymn. Well, it's been great to uh, hear from Stephanie about how she felt about sung worship. And 
uh, the trials and tribulations of Zoom. Uh, we spent so much time with the AB team trying to get the sound bits right the, uh, on the settings in, in Zoom and all the rest. Um, and I guess some of us uh, are, uh, you know, it, it's serving a really useful purpose. Um, but many of us are delighted that we at least have the option of being together again in person. But Zoom is not all bad, right? And um, I must confess that I quite enjoy looking into everybody's houses. Okay, I've said it now. I know, but, I, but I'm not the only one, right? I bet I'm not the only one. Yeah, and I know that some of you guys are watching this morning. You're joining in worship. You're in your pajamas. You've not done your hair. And do you know what? I'm really grateful you have not turned your cameras on. So thank you for... <laughs> Thank you for that and bless you and actually we are really delighted you're joining us anyway and honestly that is a fantastic aspect of Zoom and also uh, it is lovely to see in your houses. Uh, I'm very amused. Joe. you've got your bookcase out. Good job. Uh, <laughs> you're looking uh, good to see all your reference books. Alison's there. We can, we can see uh, in, into the, the window just out there. The cat's not joined you this week. Um, who's just flicked their camera on? Was that George? Hey, hi. Um, but we, it, this is great for the more nosy amongst us. And um, <laughs> if you were watching uh, Zoom uh, services from my house, you'll have learned a little bit about me. You'll have learned that I love a nice plant. Uh, you, yeah, you will. Uh, that I like an orchid, I do, um, and that I had got a few pictures on my walls. Now, I always had great intentions to make, I've got a beautiful one, actually, an African one of the Last Supper, and I'd always intended to put that behind when I was leading worship from home, because, frankly, it's just a lot more appropriate than um, some lovely paintings from Nepalese street scenes. Nothing wrong with that, but uh, I actually had one that was brilliant, but needless to say, I didn't get round to it. But the point is that by seeing each other on Zoom, we just get this little window into each other's houses, not in a, like we can order it how we want and we all learn fairly quickly to tidy up the background, right? Uh, I did anyway, um, but I think if some of you might say you probably could have learned a bit quicker, but anyway, you'd be right, frankly. Uh, I was always a bit jealous, to be honest, because Cliff has the bookshelf in his office. It's our joint bookshelf, but he was always the one who looked intellectual, not myself. But that's perfectly right. I mean, he, he is, but, uh, but yeah, I wanted that. Uh, but also it did have the uh, camel puppet on the top shelf, which kind of brought us appropriately back to earth. Anyway, the point is, the point is you get it, that we get a little window into each other's houses. And actually, uh, the, that is exactly what Sue has brought to us in our reading this morning. She's brought to us a snapshot of the house of God. And it does tell us something about God's values, what is important to him. Uh, and so uh, you'll remember that we're following this journey of the Israelites. And as they wandered in that wilderness, in the time of uncertainty, and as God formed them as his children and gave them their identity as much loved people, he was with them and the tabernacle was the place where you could find God's presence. It was a specific and actual place. If you like, God had a postcode. It was that specific, a location on earth. And it was built to God's specifications, specifications that revealed his character. Oh my word, there's a bird in here. Wow. Uh, <laughs> That's uh, pr probably, uh, hi Robin, it's probably pretty appropriate for St Francis Church uh, that we might have a bird. I think if we just let it um, gently fly around, open some doors and trust that it will go, uh, we'll all be good and not too distracted, she says. Actually lying. <laughs> <laughs> oh, poor little thing. Okay, we, we, there's nothing really that we can do that will be kinder than to just let it go in its own time. So let us do that. Anyway, um, just thinking about the tabernacle, we, a lot of the book of Exodus is taken up 
with the specification for the tabernacle. We've got chapters 25 to 31, where it uh, gives the actual uh, specification for the construction. And then the second bit, chapters 35 to 40, gives like how it was all built. Um, and the part that we heard at the very end of the reading was about the building work and what happened as God came and moved in, if you like. So um, before we, uh, before we uh, dive in and look at the construction of the tabernacle in more detail, um, let's just have a, a look. Let's just briefly think about what comes in the middle. So you've got the construction of the tabernacle, uh, the, de the description of it, the plans, if you like. You've got a gap in the middle and then you've got how it was built. But this gap in the middle is quite important uh, because while God was telling Moses how he wanted his heavenly home to look, uh, the Israelites were busy at the bottom of Mount Sinai building a golden calf. Uh, and they were doing it under the instruction of Moses' brother Aaron, the one who'd been called by God to lead the Israelites with Moses. And I think it's really shocking reading that even after God had freed uh, the Israelites from Egypt, he'd got them across the Red Sea with all these massive displays of God's power. Uh, he'd miraculously provided food for them in the manna, these Israelites still turned their backs on God just as soon as they could. As soon as they were alone for a moment, they had turned their backs on him and were busy up to their own devices doing their own thing. That's shocking. But I guess what I find even more shocking is that I've got exactly the same tendency to do my uh, things my way and sin, even though I know that God is close. So I think that's a really good warning as we head off towards the tabernacle. And we're going to just uh, go on a bit of a tour together uh, this morning. So just imagine that you are in the chaos and babble of the Israelite camp. Uh, no doubt there were birds fluttering around the place. Um, but let's just head through the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle and into the outer court. Um, I'm looking nervous because we're shutting too many doors now. Could we leave the doors open, please? Thank you very much. Let's head in through the curtain at the entrance of the tabernacle and into the outer court. And straight away, the atmosphere changes as we go in through that curtain. Suddenly, everything's really well organized. It's really well ordered. There's peace. The atmosphere is different. And the first thing that we come to as we enter the outer court is a huge altar for burnt offerings with horns on the four corners. And frankly, it's pretty gory because it's spattered with the blood of the animals that have been taken there for the burnt offerings. And this is the place where sin offerings are made before we can go any nearer the tabernacle itself. And having made our offering uh, we head towards the tent and stop at the big ceremonial basin because it's here that the priests wash themselves. God wants the sin of the people to be dealt with before they come any further. That much is plain. Let's go inside the big tent. It's got these gorgeous curtains covering the timber frame. It's got a kind of a coating over that of animal skin. But as we walk in, we can see these beautiful, exquisite dyes of red and purple and blue in these really gorgeous linen and yarn. It's richly coloured and there are cherubim, the angels, woven into the cloth. And as we see these, we notice that this is the place where heaven is touching earth. It's the place where God has made his home among the people, right in the middle of this wilderness. If you look straight ahead, you'll see that there are more curtains that separate off the Holy of Holies. But where we are now in the holy place, if you look to the right and to the left, there are some uh, beautiful ornate ornaments. And one of them is uh, a lampstand. It's got seven branches and the tips of the branches are beautifully sculpted into flowers. And it's there that you can just light the oil and that lights up this space. If you look on the other side, 
you'll see a big table and on that table are various things. But in particular, there's freshly baked bread that's put there every day. <coughs> Excuse me. It's flat bread. And it's a reminder of God's covenant with his people that was sealed over that meal in heaven uh, that God had with Moses, seven of the elders and Aaron some way back in Exodus. Turn and look straight ahead again. Um, look towards the Holy of Holies and there is a golden altar with incense on it, with the incense rising to God. And it's a cloud of incense that is to protect the priest from being in God's direct presence. And this whole place is awe-inspiring. Everywhere we look, there's this sense of the splendor and beauty of order in chaos, of beauty in the desert. And we sense echoes of God's perfect creation in Eden. But finally, let's peek behind the gold altar of incense and the curtain into the holiest place. The Israelites can't go in, only the priest can once a year uh, with a rope tied around his ankle in case he dies in the most awesome presence of God. Uh, but, you know, we can go in, we can go and have a look. And inside the Holy of Holies, it's perfectly square, completely covered in gold. And in the middle is the Ark of the Covenant, a chest that's covered in gold again with the cherubim over the top. And inside there, there are the Ten Commandments on the stone tablets. There's some manna as a symbol of God's provision and Aaron's staff that was permanently in bud, a sign of everlasting life. And it's here between the wings of the cherubim that God said that he would meet with Moses to speak with him. This is the touching place of God on earth. And just to help us visualize that, we've got a very short video clip that will take us on a tour. Uh, you've been on a tour in your imagination. Let's uh, follow that with this clip and uh, follow it once more. it is I wonder if that's how it looked in your imagination um, or maybe your imagination was even more splendid I hope it was I hope it was um, but when the Israelites finally reached the promised land it was Solomon wasn't it who built the temple really to the same design as the tabernacle um, and it provided exactly the same function God's physical location on earth and today this does sound quite strange to us, doesn't it? Uh, we know that God's present everywhere by his Holy Spirit, not just in one building, however special that might be, but it wasn't like that on the Exodus journey. Um, we've seen so much of God's character as we've had a look around the tabernacle, that huge altar of burnt offerings um, to deal with our sin as we came in because God is holy and he can't stand sin. We've seen the beauty of the craftsmanship and the materials taking us back to Eden, 
God's perfect design for humanity, where God will meet with his people again, just as he did then. And the Holy of Holies that was entirely unapproachable, but by the uh, all but the high priest once a year. But that picture of the tabernacle or the temple gives us a picture that is incomplete. So let's just uh, quickly retrace our steps through that outer court and towards the Holy of Holies again. Because we saw that huge altar for burnt offerings. And now we don't need burnt offerings because Jesus is the perfect Lamb of God who died to deal with our sin. We walk past the wash basin, but now it's Jesus who washes us clean. So what about the lampstand and the bread in the holy place? Well, Jesus is both the bread of life and the light of the world. And the incense on the golden altar is no longer needed to protect the priest or any of us as we enter the Holy of Holies. Instead, in the book of Revelation, we read that it is the prayers of God's people that rise like incense to God's throne. And what about that inaccessible Holy of Holies where Moses was to go and talk with God? Well, do you remember when Jesus died on the cross? And in that moment that he breathed his last, the curtain in the temple ripped in two. Because in Jesus' death, we're granted access to that most holy place where there is no barrier to God's presence. And by his spirit, God's presence is around us and living within us. As the temple curtain ripped in two, there was no longer any need for a tabernacle or a temple. God had begun something new. So if we now here have access to God's continual presence, does that mean that the tabernacle is no longer of any importance to us? Well, as I finish, let me just give you a few reasons why this picture of the tabernacle is helpful for us today. Firstly, I tend to take God's presence with me and in me for granted. But when we see the extraordinary construction, the beauty, the detail, even the ritual around the tabernacle, just so the Israelites might have access to God's presence, and even then just through one of the priests, it reminds us how amazing it is that each one of us, we don't need a dog collar anymore, uh, each one of us has direct access to God. The Israelites had to move the tabernacle with them and follow that fiery, cloudy pillar. But we have access to God's presence all the time by the power of his Holy Spirit. Secondly, if we don't always find it easy to be aware of God's presence with us now, could I suggest that we go on that journey through the tabernacle or the temple in our minds? It reminds us how we need to confess sin, the things that separate us from God, so that we can get close to him. The imagery of the Garden of Eden reminds us that God always wants to walk closely with us. Remember Genesis, where God walked with Adam and Eve in the cool of the day. And as we imagine our passage through the holy place and into the holy of holies, where God had promised to meet with Moses between the cherubim on the ark, so we can go there without any hindrance and sense the glory of God's presence as we encounter him. So finally, I want to ask you a question that Paul the Apostle asked the church in Corinth. Do you not know, St. Francis Church, that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? The tabernacle and the temple is where God has dwelt with his people throughout the big story of the Bible. So if we, God's people, are his temple, it's through us that God now makes his presence known on earth. Us as individuals, sure, but very much us as a church community, a church family. Uh, whether you've been at St. Francis for years or whether you've come for the first time today. It's through us that others will discover and access God. Through us, 
that God's glory will be found on earth. Do you know that you are God's temple and that God's spirit dwells in you? Let's pray. Lord God, we confess that we so easily take your presence with us for granted. And as we come to you now, we confess that we so often think and do things which separate us from you, but we choose to walk with you just as you made us to do. Please would you come and fill us with your spirit that we might bear your glory and share your glory with the world around us. Amen. Let's just for a moment rest in God's presence and we're going to sing together but I'll start us off and I'll ask you to stand as we go through the song. But let's just start off just recognising God's presence here. thank you that you are here you move in our midst and you dwell inside each one of us so lord may we know you close each moment and have the courage to share that with those around us amen please do have a seat and uh, we uh, christine is now going to lead us in our intercessions so let's remain in prayer
So this morning, as we pray, we're going to use uh, the image of a stone being dropped into a pond and rippling outwards, starting with ourselves and moving outwards through our community to the wider world. At the end of each prayer, when I say, Lord, in your mercy, please respond, hear our prayer. Compassionate Lord, who raised a little girl to life and healed the sick, we lift to you those known to us who are ill, grieving, or weighed down with work issues or other worries. We remember Tony, praying that he will soon feel better after the effects of chemotherapy. And for Jim, who has also had cancer treatment, praying he would get back his quality of life. We ask that you hear our heartfelt cries for those we care about and bring your healing power into all the situations we're thinking about right now. Help us to turn our own worries into prayers whenever we think about them and thereby grow in faith and trust in you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So the ripples move out further. Loving Lord, who showed your care for people wherever you went, we pray for our communities. We remember our schools, for St. Francis School next door to us, and for all local schools. May the children thrive. May the staff have joy in their work. May the work of the governors be fruitful. We remember those who provide medical care in GP surgeries, in hospitals, and in care homes, that they would have sufficient time and funding to do their jobs. We pray for the community here at St. Francis as we seek to grow your kingdom of love and hope where we are. Please continue to bless our twice weekly cafe and give us all compassion and imagination as to how to serve you here. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So the ripples move out further. Mighty Lord, who commanded the storm to be still, we pray for our nation. We sometimes feel helpless at the great amount of need there is in our country. We pray for our political life, for good parliament where government and opposition hone each other. We pray for those in the House of Lords who will be debating assisted dying legislation this month. We pray for the right outcome for that. We remember the police and the recent events which have demonstrated need for urgent change. We pray for all in senior positions. Give them the insight, skills and courage to forge a better way. Please show us how we can make a difference to our country, whether by writing to MPs, signing petitions or getting actively involved in some way. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. So the ripples move out further. Lord of all, we pray for our world. We hear the groans of labor pains in creation, which your word speaks about, and see much weather-related destruction. We pray for those on La Palma and Hawaii who have been affected by volcanoes erupting for people in West Pakistan who suffered a severe earthquake this week. We pray for those who have been displaced by floods or forest fires throughout the world. And for the aid agencies trying to feed and shelter desperate people. We recognize the human impact on the climate and pray for the preparations towards the COP26 climate talks in Glasgow at the end of this month the promises and plans that so urgently need addressing, we pray that they may happen. We remember Christians living in countries where it is detrimental and even dangerous to identify 
identify as a follower of Jesus, please give them wisdom and strength in their situations. I wonder now if we could speak out countries that we know and care about, whether you're here in person or listening on Zoom. Let's name those countries out loud in the next 10 seconds or so. Don't worry about clashing with others. Let's do it. Haiti. DRC. Philippines. Lord, we lift to you all these countries and the peoples we've been thinking about. In your mercy, hear our prayer. Let's join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins, as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours, now and forever. Amen. Remain in prayer as we give thanks for the collection. Lord God, we thank you for all that's been given through the basket at the back, through our bank accounts, through our websites. And we ask that all that is given might be used for your glory and uh, to share your presence with the community that we find ourselves in. In Jesus' name. Amen. Would you like to look up? Um, notices, well, uh, I'm sure you know I'm going to say that all the notices are in the notice sheet that gets emailed out. If you don't get it, please do let me know. Um, and if you don't do emails and you'd like to have a hard copy, then we can arrange that through the church office. So just let me know about that. Um, but just to say that um, this evening, as I've already mentioned, we'll be gathering here at six very informally uh, just to pray and to worship God together in sung worship, um, maybe to share some stories of what God's been doing uh, around the place. So you'd be really welcome to come. Um, but as I say, it'll be pretty low tech. So bring your own cup of tea and there'll be uh, uh, if you need reading glasses, bring them because we'll just use song sheets. Um, Tomorrow morning, uh, we're going to share communion together at 10 o'clock. We're going to try um, this timing out uh, for um, uh, the rest of this term, just to share communion at our 10 o'clock Monday prayer meeting. We'll do that once a month. Um, but if that's something you'd like to join in, it'll be quite informal, um, but we'll be using the little books of liturgy at 10 o'clock here in the church building tomorrow. You'd be very welcome to join us. Um, and I think that's the most important notices. Uh, we're going to sing uh, our final song, one that many of us will know quite well, As the Deer Pants for the Water. It's a beautiful uh, song. It comes from a psalm speaking of our longing for God and how we long to uh, spend more time in his presence, uh, the very essence of worship, which we've been talking about today. So let's stand wherever we are, if we're able, and join in this last song together. <laughs>
if you would like prayer for anything, then please do get in touch with myself or one of the other leaders or anyone you know and trust. We'd love to pray with you. If you're on Zoom, do just stay and we'll have breakout rooms. Uh, you'll have to bring your own coffee. But if you're in the church building, uh, the coffee's just gone outside uh, and you can help yourself to a cuppa. And uh, it's still dry and fairly warm. So let's enjoy catching up with each other out in the garden after the service. A final blessing. May the God of hope fill us with all joy and peace in believing through the power of the Holy Spirit. And may the blessing of God Almighty, the Father, the Son and the Holy Spirit rest upon you and those whom you love and pray for this day and always. Amen. So let's go in peace to love and to serve the Lord. In the name of Christ. Amen. Thank you.